Um, so good evening. It's it, both a pleasure and delight to be here. Uh, I started my conservation career off here at DICE. I was part of the 1998-99 MSC cohort. So it's almost 21 years ago that Richard Griffiths signed off on my travel authorization form for a very half-baked plan to go and study Sumatran tigers for two months uh, as part of my MSc project. So apparently things didn't go too badly wrong because uh, I then continued my PhD here and my postdoc on Sumatran tigers working with Nigel Leader Williams as my supervisor and uh, collaborator. And this is my, I wanted to share with you a photo, this is my first Sumatran tiger photo, but just as importantly as this is this gentleman that you see here, that, that's Nata. So he was part of the 2007-2008 DICE MSc course, and he now runs ZSL Sumatran Tiger program. And for me that really stresses uh, one of the real core strengths that DICE has always maintained, which is building the capacity of conservation practitioners in biodiversity rich countries. So I was at DICE for perhaps just a little bit over 10 years. After that I worked for Fauna and Flora International, FFI, and their Indonesia program. So that was for about seven years. Um, and actually very recently I was chatting to some of my FFI colleagues who continued the, the camera trapping work and I was delighted to hear that uh, Tiger that Natter and I were camera trapping in 2005 and 2009 uh, popped up again in their camera traps in 2015. So it suggests that their, that their conservation strategy here is in Kerinci Sablat National Park in Sumatra. That conservation strategy seems to be working. And so my talk tonight is going to focus a lot on uh, what the WCS is doing on uh, conserving critically endangered animals like the Sumatran tiger, uh, but also taking examples from some of our projects where we're actually moving towards recovering species, so increasing species population trends. Um, I am the Deputy Country Director of WCS's Indonesia program. I've been for about uh, three and a half years now. And I'll, I'll be drawing on some of the examples from our terrestrial projects, but also from some of our marine projects as well. Now, before that, I would like to introduce you to Indonesia, for those of you that don't know it. Picture in your minds the mainland United States, fragmented into 17,000 islands, populated with 265 million people, and there you have the Indonesian archipelago, a volcanic island chain. However way you measure the biodiversity species richness there, it ranks number one for marine species richness. It's located in the heart of the Kroll Triangle, which is the epicenter for marine biodiversity and species richness. It ranks number two in the world for terrestrial species richness, and it ranks number three in the world for rainforest, tropical rainforest expanse. So it's a, it's a fascinating and it's an amazing place uh, to work, and again, also a privilege. So WCS has worked in Indonesia since the 1960s, We've held a formal MOU with the Ministry of Environment and Forestry since 1995. Our approach here is really one of building strong and enduring partnerships with government agencies, with uh, community organisations. And what we tend to do is we pick a few key priority sites and we really invest in those sites to, uh, to achieve positive conservation outcomes. And this would include places like uh, Bagani Nani Waterbone National Park in Sulawesi, where we've worked for about 18 years, uh, in Kadamunjau, which is a marine national park, so we've been there for about 15 years, Wake Canvas National Park, where we've been for, there for 16 years, Bukit Barisan Salata National Park, just over 20 years now, uh, Gununglosa, we've been there for about 15 years. Um, um, what I'd like to do is start by talking about some of our terrestrial projects, so BBS and Gunanglosa. So a mainstay approach in, for Indonesian biodiversity conservation in terrestrial PA is through uh, terrestrial protected areas. Now a core part of the strategy there is to have forest ranger patrols as part of your law enforcement component. Um, WCS, we work in five terrestrial protected areas. We support with government 
30 patrol teams, they're government community teams, and their main priority is uh, conducting desnaring patrols. Uh, snare traps, as you can see, they can maim and kill tigers, but also many, many other highly threatened species, so removing them is a, is a top priority for us. And what we've been doing is uh, introducing this adaptive management system called SMART, or a SMART patrol system. And what, what, what this means is that the, the data from the range of patrols to the patrol efforts gets fed into the, fed into the system. Uh, it gets analyzed. We look at the changing patterns of threats over space and also over time. And then we use that to, to guide or to direct the next patrol. So we're targeting the most at-risk areas and therefore being more strategic and more effective. This is important because we work in vast, rugged landscapes with volcanoes and mountains higher than 3,000 meters. So it's really rough terrain and we need to be picking uh, the correct areas. So this, because these are large areas, we have to work in partnerships. We always support the government. Uh, we try and collaborate where other NGOs are working there as well. And the Los Ricos system is a very good example of that, where WCS, FKL, OIC are working with uh, the national park there. This is this area, and the, this is a national park, and you have the forest that expands outside of here. That's 2.5 million hectares. So to give you some context, Wales is 2 million hectares. So you can imagine the challenges of patrolling and protecting that area. But as you can see through this collaborative approach, you know, over time our patrol efforts, the areas we're patrolling, are now beginning to, beginning to cover the entire edge of that forest landscape, uh, which is an incredible achievement. It's a, also a similar story for Bukit Barasan and Salatan National Park, and these are two key tiger landscapes here. And you can see that the darker the red, the more intense the patrols, because they will be the at-risk priority areas. But again, over time, how we're covering vast sections of these protected areas. And to give you just a little bit of context, so Sumatra is the sixth largest island in the world. The length of Sumatra is 1,800 kilometers. You know, we're patrolling over 10,000 kilometers, almost 9,000 kilometers so in a year. So you, you, you can see the sheer amount of effort that's going in to protect those landscapes. And the approach has always got to be that you develop these replicable models and you demonstrate how the systems can work. And from that, through these government partnerships, we then worked with Ministry of Environment and Forestry and they set up the SMART task force. So it's a national level task force. And what it meant is that other tiger landscapes, then it was much easier for them to adopt and implement these approaches with their partners. And this is just some data over the past four years, but essentially in all the landscapes, you can see that the patrol efforts are really increasing, 165% uh, increase. Um, um, this, 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 this approach it extends now way beyond just smart and protected areas. This has become an Indonesia-wide protected area strategy. And that includes the island of Sulawesi. So I'd briefly like to introduce you to Sulawesi. This is the, the 11th largest island in the world, but in my humble opinion, it ranks number one as the quirkiest island in the world. And I'm not just talking about its shape. I mean, whatever your sort of alphabetic persuasion is, it looks like a, a hyperextended letter K, or it looks like the letter H doing yoga. But actually, just as interesting as its shape is its biodiversity, and it really has the most bewildering array of biodiversity. So taking mammals, if you remove bats from the, the mammal species list, 98% of Sulawesi's mammals are endemic just to that one island. That's 73 species. Uh, the bird population there, the bird fauna, 65% uh, of the birds there occur nowhere else on Earth. These are hundreds and hundreds of species just on that, on that one island. And so we've been here, as I was saying, for, for, for 18 years. Um, and with such an introduction, it would be remiss of me if I wasn't just to share one slide on the recent camera trapping work that we've been doing in, in, in Sulawesi. So the island of Sulawesi has seven species of macaque, and of course they're all endemic species of macaque. And up in our section here, uh, where we're focusing uh, through our camera trapping work, we started to map out the spatial distribution, or in this case segregation, of the 
critically endangered black-crested macaque and then the vulnerable demogor or gorontalo macaque. And I guess what was fascinating from this study with our camera traps, there was zero overlap. Not one camera trap had the two species together. There was this spatial separation that was so distinct. Now, in the northern part of the study area, there's a big river, so that may explain it. But in this southern part here, there is no natural physical barrier to separate these two species, but yet somehow they do. And until I'm proven wrong, the standing hypothesis will be the innovative patrolling technique of their boundaries of the, of the black crested macaques riding on a babarusa. So um, that's yet to be disproven. But also our, our, our camera trapping work uh, recorded the first ever photograph in the wild of a Sulawesi woodcock from Tancoco Nature Reserve. And yes, of course, this is endemic. We also started to map out um, the abundance of uh, Anoa, Babarusa, Sulawesi warty pig. Yep, all three of those are endemic to the island as well. And I guess the interesting part here is that in the, in the eastern part of this part of Sulawesi, it's predominantly Christian, and so there's quite high levels of bushmeat consumption there. But when you get to this part of Sulawesi, it tends to be predominantly Muslim, and there's a lot of uh, prohibitions on eating meat. And so what we're doing now is analyse, analysing the abundance of these uh, various ungulates to see uh, how uh, religion's playing a, playing a role in their conservation or not. So a Sumatran tiger would be very, very happy if it had this level of ungulate biomass in the forest. And so Sulawesi being quirky is, of course, slightly different here. And Sulawesi's apex predator, or Sulawesi's large carnivore, is this little fella here, the five kilogram Sulawesi civet, uh, red in tooth and claw. And of course, it's endemic to the island, yeah? And so what we've been doing through our camera trapping work is we've been mapping out the uh, spatial distribution, the habitat preference, but also the niche separation with this guy here, the, the Malay civet, um, which is a non-endemic. So we do have one, and I actually feel he should get a round of applause for being able to stick it out in Sulawesi with all the other endemics. Um, so it is fascinating. And unfortunately, a lot of, a lot of these animals, we find that they... Uh, turn up in the bushmeat trade. So you've got a, a Sulawesi civet, a critically endangered black crested macaque, and then you have a, a babarusa there. And so what it means is that we've really got to look at what our law enforcement strategy is. So we stop these animals getting, getting caught, hunted in the wild, first of all. And this is where we now start to introduce our smart patrol system. And we're using our camera trap data like this to then guide the patrol teams also. So. This is Sulawesi's, for a Sulawesi protected area, this is the first smart patrol system. It's very much based on the Sumatra models. And in fact, in this national park, the new head of the national park uh, was formerly in Bukit Barasan, Salatan National Park in Sumatra. And so we set up the smart patrol system there with him here. And so you can see that it's beginning to make progression over time, but also over space. And what I'd like to do now is briefly return to Sumatra and that patrol effort that we were looking at first of all. And this is from Gunamlosa, and I, I, was, I was saying to my, my camera trapping team that you know when you've found that sweet spot in the forest for a Sumatran tiger because it will sit down in front of your camera traps and just spend 10, 15 minutes there. Um, so I showed you this slide earlier, the, the increasing patrol effort and how we're increasing the protection over these key tiger landscapes over time. And so what this has resulted in, more importantly, is this dramatic decline in tiger poaching rates in the major tiger landscapes. And these, like, the, the data points that make up these lines, that's the same as 347 tiger snare traps. It's over time, but just again, to put that in a little bit of perspective, there's about 500 Sumatran tigers yeah, in the wild. And so if you can imagine every one of those 347 traps called a tiger, it would have a dramatic increase, dramatic uh, impact on the tigers. Um, these teams also pulled out over this time period, they pulled out 1,307 tiger prey snare traps. So although the trend is a very, very um, encouraging one, 
Sumatran tigers are still critically endangered. There's still few of them and poaching does still occur. So what it means is we just got to keep progressing this law enforcement strategy through the, the smart patrols. But again, the, the positive news, and this now comes from two of WCS's sites where we're working with the national park authorities, that looking at our long-term camera trap data, what it's telling us that is from Losa, you know, there's a stable tiger population trend, and from Bukit Barrow San Salatan, you know, we're now finding this increasing tiger population trend. And just as important when we're looking at our camera trap data, we're finding evidence of uh, females with their cubs uh, from, from each of our landscapes. We're also finding a high number of recaptures of the same individuals. We're finding a sex ratio of three females to one male. And all of this is indicative of a really healthy or a, a stable tiger home range. And it shows that we've got these healthy populations that are beginning, truly beginning to recover, um, which if you hear the news, you don't always pick up that. So this for me would be the definition of success, of a successful project. However, it doesn't quite feel like an unequivocal success. And here's why. So these are, this is the cases that our, our counter wildlife trafficking teams have been handling on Sumatran tigers. I'm just giving you recent years examples. This goes back many, many years. So, you know, you can see the tigers that are getting pulled out of the landscape still, even though we're increasing the patrol effort inside the forest. That's 2016, this is from 2017, six tiger skins. This is from 2018, so there's four tiger skins. There's two stuffed tigers as well, which may be from collections from before, but still, these are all Sumatran tigers that have been pulled out of our rainforests. And this is an example from one landscape in Sumatra last year. So not just tigers, but all the wildlife that was seized through the work that we were conducting with the government partners. This is a Sumatran landscape, and I just highlighted this because you remember the Babarusa from before, yeah? It's a Sulawesi endemic, and so that's turning up in the trafficking network uh, where we're operating. And so from the 15 cases or sting operations which were conducted by the government law enforcement operations, you see the, the timeline and the animals that are coming out. But I wanted to point out this. This is a, a helmeted hornbill, or helmeted hornbill cast. There's 16 of them. Now, about five years ago on the red list, the IUCN red list, helmeted hornbills were near threatened. They immediately jumped to being critically endangered, which means they're on the verge of extinction um, because of the, the, the high international demand for their cast. So for us last year to lose 16 helmeted hornbills from one landscape into Matra is a massive blow for us. And it, and it really just highlights the enormity of the challenge that we face. Indonesia is an incredibly biodiversity rich country. It's therefore a source country for the Asia to Asia illegal wildlife trade. And when you see photos like this, you can, you can see the, the, the scale of the challenge that we are up against. So again, another case that we were gathering information on with our partners, this is this is what five tons of dead pangolins looks like in North Sumatra. And so I know quite often the illegal wildlife trade is talked about in terms of poverty. But actually for me, when I look at this and I look at all the other cases that we're working on, it's really about wealth. And it's about that desire of rich people for luxury goods in other countries. So this is five tons of pangolins, frozen pangolins. Um, pangolins weigh about five kilos. Uh, we're talking about volumes in the ton here. Uh, there's been other seizures in the tons as well of Sunda pangolins. They're critically endangered. And with these, with, these, with, with these animals here, a lot of them are they're traded for their scales. They're also traded for their meat. There's a lot of demand for them in China and also in Vietnam. Um, and really, what, what it does is it just, just essentially urges us to, to up our game a bit here. Um, so, the WCS approach is to work through our Wildlife Crimes Unit. It's been operating since 2003. 
uh, is very much one of uh, capacity building or providing technical assistance. So we, we operate in informant networks, so mainly community informant networks across landscapes, across seascapes, in urban areas as well, where uh, a lot of the transit or trafficking points are. And you can see over the years how through these trainings and through this support, um, the number of government sting operations that have been conducted, the number of arrests of poachers and traders, and also the conviction. So it's not just the police or Ministry of Environment and Forest, it's also the judges and also the prosecutors who we work with. So it's definitely having an impact of sorts. And one of the things that we do with the data, so the intel data that's generated, we start to map the trading networks, the connectivities within these criminal networks. We look at who the kingpins are, so who are the most connected people within these, and that is then used to, uh, as the targets for uh, the government to then conduct their law enforcement operations. So it's intentionally blurred, but just to let you know that the red boxes or the red circles, they're the people who have been arrested and convicted. But with that, the law enforcement networks, and these are, these are just, this is just the tiger trafficking network here, um, that tiger trafficking network will change over time with arrests, with people getting taken out of the network, with new intel data or uh, actors who we didn't know about before. And just another example of just the complexity of these networks. This is the, this is the, the, the bird trafficking network for eastern Indonesia or the Eastern Indonesian species. And the key point here is that each of those colored boxes represents the actors on a different island in Indonesia and how they're connected with each other. And so before I was telling you Indonesia is 17,000 islands, but all of a sudden this archipelago nation starts to feel quite interconnected and quite small. And the networks, as you can see, become quite sophisticated as well. So we put a lot, of, a lot of effort in, and this is over the, the recent years, so the past three to four years, a lot of effort into working with the prosecutors, working with judges as well, um, training them in the laws pertaining to the illegal wildlife trade, so that they know it's just as important to arrest, to prosecute a tiger trafficker as it is a pangolin trafficker. You know, most of them don't know what a pangolin is, they know what a tiger is. Um, to get them to better understand why the wildlife is important, but also what their role is, and that they are also mandated not just to uh, prosecute for narcotics or human trafficking or uh, weapons offences, but also illegal wildlife trade. And what we find is happening now is that there has been elicit elicited a really positive response, and Ministry of Environment and Forestry working with the Attorney General's office, which is where the prosecutors are, um, they've set up a task force and they've been started with Sumatra, but province by province across Sumatra, they've been documenting the wildlife stockpile, so developing an inventory, and then actually burning or uh, conducting ivory crushes. And that's actually the first time that Indonesia has been destroying or crushing its ivory. And so, you know, this is setting a new precedent and they're going to now they've finished Sumatra, they're going to move to Kalimantan and Java and other islands and essentially sort of remove this wildlife from, uh, from potentially getting back into the trade. But the important part here is with the training, with the technical assistance, that the fines, the prison sentences have been increasing over time. So this is for all wildlife. Um, so you can see just that, that positive trend over time. Um, this is good, but what we're finding is that um, you're actually now, this is the maximum, uh, the maximum final prison sentence you can get, but we are finding now that traffickers are getting the maximum fine. However, this represents those trafficking tigers, whereas this really low fine here would be for someone who was caught trafficking a helmeted hornbill. And as I explained before, helmeted hornbills being critically endangered on the verge of extinction uh, should be treated just the same as tigers. They're both protected species. So there's obviously still a bit of work we've got to do, but nevertheless, you know, there's definitely a positive trend going on here. What we're also finding is that now, like 
most things in life, it's moving to being online. And a lot of the illegal wildlife trade has now switched to being sold and traded online. Uh, Facebook, without a doubt, being the number one trading platform. There's also some e-commerce sites as well. So we need to diversify our partnerships. We need to diversify the sources of information now we're basing our decisions on and what we are monitoring. And because it's a lot of the illegal wildlife trade is also transboundary, that naturally brings in other government agencies there. And uh, we would often work with our other WCS country programs in, in um, sharing information with them also. And this becomes important when you start talking about the transnational trade, because in May 2016, WCS received information from one of our informants, in this case it was a fisherman, in a very, very remote part of eastern Indonesia. Uh, you know, you can see, it's really in the middle of nowhere. And using his mobile phone, he took a photo and he showed us that there were two whale sharks that were being held in captivity. So uh, you can obviously see one here, but there's another whale shark in there as well. These whale sharks, they're over four meters long. I mean, I'm two meters, yeah, so it's twice the size of me. So these are massive animals. And what they were doing is they were awaiting to be transported to a, an aquarium in China, and they were going to fly in. And remember, this is a remote part of Indonesia. They were going to fly in a Russian cargo jet, a Russian cargo plane, one of those Antonov ones. So you think those big gray planes that you put tanks in and things. Uh, that's how these were going to get shipped out of here. And so the decision was whether we wait or whether we act quickly, uh, you know, seize the plane. Um, anyway, we obviously worked through our government partners. In this case, it was the Ministry of Marine Affairs and Fisheries, and they very swiftly mobilized. They went to the site, they arrested the traffickers, and fortunately, the whale sharks were saved and released back into the ocean. But this really highlights the point when you look at these, these large marine creatures such as this. They're slow growing, they're long lived, they have quite a low uh, reproductive capacity, um, and that makes them very, very disproportionately vulnerable to being over harvested. However, they're also very much in high demand for the international trade, and this is where these species, you see the, the importance of having that, that, that critical, timely, site-based response. Um, this would also apply to another species that fits that criteria, which is manta rays. So in recent years, and I am just talking in recent years, this isn't something that goes back uh, centuries or millennia. In, in recent years, there's been a very, very high international demand for manta ray gills, um, particularly in places like Hong Kong. Now, at the same time, in Indonesia, manta-based tourism generates somewhere between 10 to $15 million per year. A lot of that revenue goes directly into supporting local economies. So you see how they, important they are for Indonesia. And um, there's one particular site that WCS was asked to provide support for um, because the population there was decimating its manta rays in response to this international demand. And that's a little sort of cluster of islands here uh, we call Lamakara. So this is in East Nusantara province. So the approach was, uh, first of all, training, mobilizing our, our government partners, the law enforcement agencies, prosecutors, judges, uh, getting them actively involved. And whilst that was going on, so at the same time, you know, we started to, with the information that we had, sort of piece together what that trafficking network was and who was involved and where they were operating and where they were based and what the volumes going through were. And from this, we found that there were something like 124 suspects, key suspects, uh, of which uh, the Indonesian police, the Ministry of Environment and Forestry made 86 arrests. So these were traffickers. And they seized 4.2 tonnes 
of Manta products, a lot of them being the gills. So again, Manta gills, they're, they're light as feather. And we're talking about tons here. So you can just think how many mantas have been taken out of the ocean, remembering that these are the long-lived, slow-reproducing species that are, just, just can't handle this level of offtake in the wild. But through the support with the judges, again, we saw uh, an even more dramatic increase in the sentences for the legal traders. So these aren't fishermen who are hunting them. These are people sitting in uh, provincial towns, in capital cities uh, who are trading the manta rays. But we also had to have a site-based approach. That approach, the, the, the primary goal of that approach was to crash the market so people couldn't sell the manta gills within Indonesia and they wouldn't get exported out. But we had to have a site-based approach as well for these species. And so what we started to do was mapping out the hotspots. We were looking at where the fishing boats were going, uh, ma mapping those out. Uh, trying to get, get an idea of where the poaching was happening. We were also using chlorophyll maps. So maps showing where the chlorophyll was, chlorophyll densities in the ocean, and where we could therefore predict where the mantas would most likely to be, and then wherefore the poaching was most likely to occur. And so that was really directing the, the marine police's patrols. So they had speedboats and they were going out onto the ocean. Um, and the point here was that it was to create a deterrent effect. It wasn't to arrest local fishermen. It was just to let them know that they were likely to get caught if they were going out to catch the mantas. And so what we found with the support was that over time, the average number of patrol days in that area uh, substantially increased. And with the increase in patrol effort, there was a decrease in the manta hunting, uh, in this case monitored by the number of mantas being landed on shore, so the dead mantas. So again, there was a definitely sort of a very positive outcome there. We, we also recognized that having this site-based enforcement approach, like with many site-based enforcement approaches, is probably never gonna be your long-term sustainable strategy. And so we were working with a local partner, an NGO called the Missile Foundation, and in parallel, they were implementing these complementary uh, livelihood projects. So offering uh, alternative livelihoods linked around fisheries still, so not something completely new or different. But there were business loans that were handed out, to low interest business loans to ex manta traders so they could diversify what they were doing. Uh, just adding value to um, some of the other fisheries um, industries that they're working on through improved markets or access. There was also local employment as well. Um, really what we found is that there was just this dramatic increase in community monitoring and community reporting of any manta huntings or sightings that were seen in these areas. Um, and we definitely took that as one, people having a better understanding of the laws, the regulations around mantas, um, but also just a uh, um, a, a greater level of pride for the mantas and just remember these mantas they generate a lot of money for tourism there are incentives really strong incentives for keeping them alive in the wild and that's one of the, the tourism areas so the good news was mantas are a fully protected species under Indonesian law we saw that decline in the population um, we saw a decline in the in the hunting unfortunately what we found is that the mobula rays, so a different type of ray species or group of rays, there's actually then started to be a real upturn in the hunting of those. And so we've got to be honest with the data, yeah? We can't make out that this is a real success story and we're now seeing these, perhaps a switch to these species being hunted. However, they're not a protected species, so it is legal to trade in them. But what it means is that we now need to start rethinking our strategy and what our goals are here uh, with protecting the mantas, but now also with protecting the mobular race. So we're looking at setting up perhaps a marine protected area, looking at sustainable fisheries management uh, with uh, zonation uh, to have better regulation and management of, of these marine species. But I guess also what it, what it really emphasizes is the importance of having laws to protect these species, um, because once people understand, they're less likely to, to hunt them. And so that leads us into the next part that I want to talk to you about. And it's about one of the, 
the biggest policy reforms that's happened for wildlife in Indonesia in the past 20 years. And it all started off with this. So in May 2015, 24 yellow-crested cockatoos were seized by customs in Surabaya, Java, one of Indonesia's busiest ports. And the public reaction in Indonesia to this was phenomenal. There was an outcry. And we decided to then build off that momentum and with a, a collection of other NGOs started a change the law campaign to call for the reform of Indonesia's overarching policy, it's called Law Number no. 5, uh, for protecting uh, wildlife, but also a lot more. Uh, within, within three months, something like 300 and 22,000 people in Indonesia had signed up calling for the change of this policy. And that then started to get political support. And we were able to use that to, to make these changes. So fast forward several years to today, the, the, the draft policy, uh, the reform draft policy is now being reviewed by the Indonesian parliament. It introduces things like minimum fines, minimum prison sentences for people uh, being caught trading, uh, poaching, handling, transporting any protected species, regardless of what it is. It's also more or less doubled the maximum fine as well. So there's been some really significant changes in there. However, uh, for a year and a half, that policy has been uh, being considered. So we'll wait to see whether it gets passed or not. But during that time, we also wanted to look at the protected species list itself, uh, which is a different regulation. So uh, regulation number seven. And we were working on a, a scientific analysis of species in trade, of highly threatened species in Indonesia, those that would justify or warrant greater protection. And from, from, from this, we were able to um, put, together a, put together a list of candidate species. And July last year, the Minister of the Ministry of Environment and Forestry enacted the revised protected species list. And what that does is it offers protection to 227 new species that weren't previously protected. That's a 25% a, a increase in the protected species list. It includes species that have been newly discovered, newly described, like the Tapanuli orangutan, uh, the new critically endangered orangutan from Sumatra. Uh, it also includes species that were so heavily hunted in the past, like the Roti Island snake neck turtle that you may never have heard of, but is one of the most endangered turtles in the world. Um, it offers that species a fighting chance, and actually one of the, the big WCS projects right now is to work in these lakes in Roti Island, which is a tiny little island in eastern Indonesia, just off Timor. Because um, we're planning to re we're planning with with Ministry of Environment and Forestry to reintroduce these turtles back into the wild, maybe as early as next year. We've built holding facilities for these turtles to come from captive facilities elsewhere back into Indonesia. So that's now a protected species. It wasn't before. And the reason why it's disappeared from those lakes is because it was over hunted, over harvested uh, a couple of decades ago. And also with a lot of our work, we've been providing support, technical assistance uh, for a lot of, a lot of uh, Indonesia's commitments and interests within CITES. So looking at the legal trade here, um, it also includes species like the Helmeted Hornbill, the government of Indonesia put forward the Helmeted Hornbill resolution at CITES, which was passed. We were then provide, able to provide support in country to follow up with a national action plan, which the government has just signed off. Um, and, and even as recent as January this year, uh, we've had a lot of support for a, something called a document called a non-detrimental finding. And it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a document that allows you to uh, have a more scientifically informed judgment on how you set quotas for the species that you're trading, uh, based on the population trends in the wild and the levels of offtake that those species can sustain. And so the first non-detrimental finding, or NDF, is for the silky shark. So it's a legally traded shark species in Indonesia, but now it has a document with a much greater scientific basis for it. And I guess as you saw with the smart patrols, and once we have that working model, how that's replicated across Indonesia, the main aim now is to replicate these NDFs for other species, so reticulated pythons being a, a key example. They're very heavily traded by Indonesia, something like 188,000 pythons per year are being exported legally, but we need a much stronger scientific base for that. So this is 
a brief overview of the work WCS is doing in Indonesia. There's a lot, lot more that we are doing, but this is some of our, our core work that we're doing. And in many ways, this is a very much a standard WCS strategy globally for the different country programs that will work. We are having an impact. We're definitely having some successes in some areas. Uh, we're definitely honest and critical enough of ourselves of where we certainly need to rethink our strategies or uh, not work harder because we work very hard already, but uh, really think about what the strategic approach would be for protecting these species. But we would like to just thank all of our donors that allow us to do this and to make all of our work happen across that vast Indonesian archipelago. And I'd also very much like to thank the people in WCS Indonesia program that make it happen. There's 253 staff that we have in Indonesia. I'm not going to now, one by one, thank them all. So I'd just like to thank some of our core team, our, our country director, our operations director, and then all of the senior programmatic staff that are within uh, my immediate team. So thank you very much.